Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. That's a really good one. Good for grounding. I'm recording already. <laughs> we entered the time portal, baby, where it just yeah. time is illusory. It doesn't exist. Welcome to Openly Spoken, the podcast to help you show up, <laughs> speak out, and be seen within your relationships, your work, and most importantly, with the relationship with yourself. In this podcast, we talk about all things self-love, relationships, sexuality, spirituality, and more. Hi, I'm your host, Celia Antonio, and I'm a women's sexuality and self-love coach, a mindfulness expert, and your cheerleader for your most grounded and expansive self-expression. You can connect with me on Instagram at selfexpressedbabe, and for all of my guest episodes, there will always be links in the show notes so that you can find them online. I give my deepest thanks to you for being here and spending your precious time with me today. Now let's begin our journey. Yeah, which is this overcast weather is rare for us. I bet it's nice though. It's a bit of a reprieve. I don't know. Oh, maybe not. It is nice because the mountains, I live right next to the mountains. The mountains here are usually brown, but it's been raining so much that when you drive, like even when you look out the window, the mountains are green. And when you drive on the freeway and parts where it's mountainous, it's green instead of brown. And for those of us that That's notice nice. those things, we're like, wow, it's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I didn't realize I was a mountain girly until I moved here and I'm surrounded. So we look, kind of live in a bowl of mountains oh that's beautiful yeah I just I love I'm obsessed yeah yeah me too so I love I them I, I grew up by the beach so I always thought I was a beach girl and then I moved to Connecticut when I was in my mid-20s and going to the mountains and the forest there and just being in nature that was so untouched compared to the beach was just magical and I'm like oh mm. okay I'm not a beach girl I'm I'm a I'm a this girl <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, oh that's oh did, were you born in California I was actually born in Germany but my mom and I moved to uh, Los Angeles when I was three I think that's where my mother wound starts <laughs> my mom and I moved when I was three when and my moved. mom got yeah and my mom got remarried and um, she didn't tell me, like, she wasn't openly communicative about, like, who my dad was, that he was still back in Germany. And um, when you're three, which I, I obviously didn't know at the time because I was three, but since then I've worked in a daycare, a three-year-old knows who their father is, even if they can't speak full sentences. They know who mom is. They know who dad is. So that for me is like where my mother wound mm -hmm. started. It started so young, that like betrayal of trust. So I'm so excited to talk to you mm -hmm. today because like the mother wound has been like one of the biggest things I've worked on in my personal life. <laughs> so um, I'm going to read off your bio to introduce you. And for people who are already listening, we've already gotten started, but welcome to Openly Spoken, <laughs> the podcast that helps you show up, speak out, and be seen. Today's guest is Michaela Tyson. I'm so excited to have you today. Michaela is a mother wound alchemist and a relationship coach, and she's been re researching shame and vulnerability for the past decade and has helped thousands of women transform their relationship to self. Informed by a decade of research and personal experiences, she focuses on what she calls your story and how that influences attachment styles, relational safety, emotional intelligence, and our ability to trust. Such big things that like, when you realize it's tied to the mother wound, you're like, oh, <laughs> and um, yeah, so these things are the key ingredients to fulfilling relationships. And a primary focus in Michaela's work is how the relationship to our mothers impacts our relational blueprint and contributes to a deep sense of not enoughness. Thank you for being mm. here. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm excited. I'm excited too. So this is such a huge topic. Mm. I'm not sure where to begin, but 
a question that came to me as I was brushing my teeth this morning, <laughs> because I know you're a mother yourself. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if your own mother wound ever made you like question, should I not have kids or like, will I not be a good mom? Mm -hmm. It's a really great question for me, for me personally, I, I would have said that I, so my daughter's nine, she's 10 this year. So I've been a mum for a long time now. And I, young, I was 23 when I had Neve. Mm -hmm. And if you'd have asked me beforehand, I would have said, I'm not very maternal. That described myself. I'm not very maternal. Um, I never kind of imagined that I wouldn't have kids, but it was definitely a later in life thing mm, uh -huh. for me. Yeah. Um, and then the universe intervened and I fell pregnant at 23. But it has greatly influenced my kind of story around being a mother and not okay. feeling equipped to be a mother has definitely played a huge part. Um, mm -hmm. And I know a lot of conversations that I have with women not wanting children because of this deep fear of repeating history is really prominent. Like it's a big fear of so many women. Mm -hmm. And I have that too. Yeah, I can relate to that. I have that too. <laughs> but what's interesting yeah. is like, if yeah. we have the fear, like we're probably already self-aware enough to not repeat that story because we're aware of it. And um, I can't speak for all mothers, but I know that the way my mom was, she did her best. It's not like she was on purpose trying to give me a mother wound, you know, but we live in an age where we have so much more information at our fingertips that we can even be aware that certain things are not okay, or even be aware that, you know, our our relationship with our mom is our very first relationship and to be aware that that sets a kind of tone for the rest of our relationships moving forward. I don't think previous generations knew that. And if they did, you only knew that if you came across it in like a class or in a book, like, cause there wasn't the internet back then, you know, it wasn't something that was so readily available. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, even, you know, I, for as long as I remember as a little girl I had like definite anxiety and there was no name for it you know yes it was just yes Michaela's a worrier and Michaela overthinks things and yeah. that very much became my identity it wasn't until I grew up I was like oh my god holy shit I'm just you know I have high function anxiety and that same there, like I said there was no name for it yeah I, for me I just thought it was normal to be like that because both my parents also have yeah. high functioning anxiety and I honestly didn't know I had anxiety until the pandemic happened. Like right before the pandemic, mm. I found myself in a situation where like I had so much on my schedule because I was saying yes to everything and yes to everyone. And then the pandemic was kind of like my excuse to cancel everything. And I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> mm. and, and that was um, I was engaged already to my husband at the time. And when I was sharing with him how I felt. He's like, that sounds like anxiety. And I'm like, huh, let me sit with that. And then I realized it was anxiety, but I, and I had, I'd had it my whole life. I just didn't notice because that's how both my parents were. So I thought that was a normal way that everyone just is. Yeah. Same, same, 100%. <laughs> yeah. How do you think uh, becoming a mom specifically to a daughter has like, been compared to how it would be to a son because like I know that you focus on working with uh, women and I know that the the mother wound is different for daughters versus sons yeah yeah it is and so I I have a son so I have a son as well he's my youngest and my daughter is my eldest so I, I do have one of each and my experience with it, it's been very different with both of them and I'm somebody that very very much seeks the truth uh, mm -hmm. and having I've had to be really kind of honest with myself and it's been really confronting just how different it has felt for me 
Uh, and the more that I've kind of acknowledged that within myself, the more that I do see the differences. Uh, I was actually having this conversation with a friend a few weeks ago and I said something to her. She had an Anna daughter. Um, and I said, for me, if I was to kind of consolidate it down to how it's felt for me, it's it's almost like my daughter shines a light on the parts of me that I find quite difficult to love, the parts of me that I've mm -hmm. disowned and the parts that I've kind of suppressed, the, the parts that it was never safe to kind of uh, embody. And my yeah. son shines a light on the parts of me that I do like. So yeah. kind of naturally how I've shown up with both of my children has been different. It's taken a lot of awareness and a lot of work mm -hmm. around that. Mm -hmm. that's so interesting yeah uh yeah yeah and it's it's confronting you know especially my daughter's my first so she's yeah. the, the eldest you know and I'm very aware I don't know what your uh experience is I'm the eldest daughter yes so am I um, so I feel like mm -hmm. yeah I feel like it's a double whammy and I'm very aware that you know my daughter is in that position as well and I, you know, if I'm completely honest, I have noticed how, especially in the beginning, because my journey really began when I fell pregnant with Neve. Mm -hmm. That was when I started to kind of see the relationship with my mother for kind of what it was. Yeah. And it was very hard to kind of avoid it. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been, it's been incredibly confronting. Yeah. You know? What's interesting about how you said with your daughter, how raising her shined lights on parts of yourself that you didn't feel safe to embody and safe to love is I recently learned in like my own journey towards becoming a coach is um, what happens in our, in our family of origin is um, parts, the parts of herself that are not celebrated whether it's from our mother or father or whoever, grandparent, any caretaker, the parts of us that are not celebrated, we learn that that's not okay because we're so young and like our survival depends on being loved and accepted. And the, the parts of us that are not celebrated, we suppress those down for so long that we forget that like that was even a part of our personality. And I think that's why realizing we have a mother wound and working on it, we start to like uncover these parts of like what we're interested in, what we like, what we value that we didn't even know about before. It's almost like when we have this mother wound, we grow up like without a sense of identity. And um, I know that's not necessarily a question, but I'd love to know your thoughts on that. <laughs> oh, I have, I have so much to say on that. Yeah. And, and, I love to tell stories and I love to use real life examples. And as you're speaking, something that I'm like going through right now, which I think is so tied into this is, and this is true for a lot of women that have quite a prominent mother wound is usually there is an element of, um, th there's usually an unhealthy relationship to our body and unhealthy relationship to food. Mm, and yes, for me that's for been sure. it's been really yeah it's been so prominent in my, my life and um as as you're talking at the moment I'm kind of going through this process where so every time that I decide I want to live healthier so no one will know this listening probably but in January so where are we at now it's April so April. three months ago I had to have emergent yeah, April. Gosh, how's it April already? I know, uh, right? An and it's surgery. April 23rd. Yeah. It's almost May. <laughs> I know. It's always May. It's tourist season, baby. Um, <laughs> I had to have emergency surgery to have my gallbladder removed. And it's really kind oh, wow. of kick-started this health. Like, I just, my priority and my focus right now is I want to feel healthy. I want to feel strong in my body. And there's a real kind of physical healing that's taking place and this has been like um my relationship to my body I have a point with this <laughs> my relationship to my body has been a really um a difficult one which yeah. I know is very rooted in the relationship to my mother and just how she related to her body and 
you mm-hmm. know what I witnessed and what she t- taught me and all of those things um and I have always and you let me know if you relate to this but I've always like done like going to the gym doing this to get my to, to feel good in my skin and I kind of get to this point where I'll feel amazing I'll be seeing results I'll be just feeling so much better and then I will find a way to sabotage myself yeah you stop going because you're like I'm fixed now <laughs> yeah absolutely and <laughs> I'm really kind of going through this now because I'm at that I'm at that point now yeah and there's 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 just this kind of ceiling that we bump up against where it's like I don't I'm I'm not feeling as safe now and I know for me my experience with my mum is there was an element of jealousy there and you see this a lot with the mother wound you know the daughter which is why the mother-daughter relationship is different because the daughter tends to remind the mother of all of her unlived potential and if the mother is not aware of this she'll be projecting that onto her daughter and that that was definitely my experience so to kind of have my dream body if you will to make a point it feels really unsafe for me yeah 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 I can relate to Um, that and that's yeah yeah and like I see and you see this all the time don't you you know it's like even at one point I tried to tell myself I just don't like the gym like that's just not me and I really encourage people to get curious about that because it's back to what you just said about identity to Mm -hmm. loop this back round we 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 adopt these identities of that's just not me yes I don't enjoy this and we never really ask ourselves why and we never go a level even 10 levels deeper than that as to why and usually it's because we don't feel safe because it's never been safe to kind of take up space in that way yeah yeah because you've learned that like if I do feel good in my body and I do have my dream body something bad is going to happen Mm. you know some something somebody is going to be upset with me (laughs) that I look better than her yeah. or something like that mm. because of that competition mm. element that we learn absolutely yeah. I'm I'm talking so much about what's really alive for me right now is visibility it's you mm. know I especially in relationships you know we want to be seen more than yes. anything else in this world but the reality is often terrified to be seen and we're we're actually terrified to be visible yes and without realizing it yeah it's it's wild how like unconscious it is and um on that thread I would love to know your thoughts on like how you have seen maybe with your clients and with yourself how the mother wound affects sexuality and how we show up in the bedroom because that's a big one you know when we don't feel it's a really big one. When we're not accepting our bodies, like for me at least, the way I went into my own like journey of sexuality from the first time I had sex, it was like my worthiness and what I had to offer was like my body rather than like my body being mine. And like this mm-hmm. is my this is my temple and like I get to put I get to set the boundaries. Like there was none of none of that existed when I started dating for the first time. And um, I'm I'm 100% sure that's tied to the mother wound for sure. <laughs> and um, yeah, I would love to hear yeah. your thoughts and your journey around that. Yeah, oh gosh, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still <laughs> on that journey very, very, very much so. Um, but this has been something that like I... I had some big realizations about this a couple of years ago. And I know for me, very, very similar to you. I honestly really didn't like myself Mm. um, for most of my life. Yeah. There there was a level of, you know, contempt really for myself. Um, And just, I was anywhere else, but in my body for Mm. most of my life. And, Mm. I know when it came to men, 
and sex and you know just sexuality as a whole it was definitely for the other person and never for me mm-hmm. um as a chronic as a chronic people pleaser it was you know what can I what can I do or how can I be and how can I act so that you value me yeah. rather than what do I want what do I need and what do I value it was never that it was never about that yeah and when a woman comes to sexuality like that with like how can I please you what can I do like there's so much energy in the head like it's just ends up being like overthinking or we're not actually dropped into our bodies and like there's no way an orgasm is happening from that from that like mindset if you're going into sex like that (laughs) and it's also no I remember Mm -hmm. go ahead (laughs) <laughs> there's a little bit a of a tiger, leg so I'm like <laughs> yeah I'm just I'm really trying to just not interrupt you um and I was just going to say I don't know if you've uh I remember about three years ago I went and had um some tantric body work done Ooh. and that was such an incredible experience and it was it was one of the first times that I realized just how much I disassociate from my body and how unsafe Mm -hmm. pleasure has always felt for me Mm -hmm. yeah um I don't know about you but pain pain has always felt quite uh in in a weird way it's always felt quite comforting to me exactly like I can agree found it yeah yeah, yeah. it's like normal it's like oh this is how life is yeah (laughs) yeah 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 but pleasure it's dangerous different kettle of mm-hmm. uh yeah yeah I can totally agree uh and relate especially like I, I I always used to joke I was born with a crayon in my hand like I always drew when I was a kid and especially when I was a teenager I felt like my pain was such a source of like inspiration of like a material to pull from to make art and so uh yeah I can definitely mm-hmm. relate to you that the pain feels comfortable because when we have a mother wound that's like our very earliest memory is like pain is what we're living with it's because it's Mm. it's essentially like an abandonment wound right yeah 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 and then when we have that abandonment wound I think that adds an extra layer of complexity to sexuality um because how how would we be able to show up as ourselves and speak out loud what we want if there's this abandonment wound in the background and like if that's in the background we're trying to prevent being abandoned like in the present moment so it's like I'm not gonna say like I want you to touch me this way because if you say no that's like a huge rejection 100 (laughs) percent yeah 100 percent, and that's definitely been there's definitely been the pattern in all of my relationships me and my husband Same here in a <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> we're in a I've been married eight years this year we've been together for 12 and we're in a really interesting um kind of place in our relationship at the moment where I am really beginning to take up space and ask for what I want and for what I need uh, without feeling like I'm I'm too much or if mm-hmm. anything. I think the biggest thing for me that's really helped me where this wound is concerned is just really strengthening my resolve that the relationship with myself is the most important thing to me and Mm -hmm. next obviously is the relationship to my husband and my children but knowing that that one with me is solid that if anything happened like I would be okay because it was all I was always coming from a place of I don't know what I would do without this person because my Uh, whole self was kind of wrapped up in that yeah. yeah Yeah, it's interesting how the mother wound creates like a codependency because we didn't get that like 
um, nurturing and like unconditional support that we needed. So then there's this constant like, oh, I need it from from somewhere else. Um, because I think when we do get it, we learn how to give that to ourselves because we are essentially, you know, like internalizing our parents and caretakers that ends up being mm -hmm. uh, making up our relationship to ourself. So I love that you bring up that piece about relationship to yourself. And I celebrate you for being on this journey and being able to grow in that with your husband, like alongside. Um, because a lot of times uh, what I've seen as a relationship coach myself is like when one partner starts to grow, then sometimes the relationship like they realize it's not aligned because they got together from that space of like, um, you know how we're like attracted to people who have those complementary kind of like traumas from childhood. <laughs> so it's oh, great yeah. when like when the guy that uh -huh. yeah. go ahead. I was just gonna say like the that, the guy that is looking for a mother, and you're like, oh, yeah, I can do that. I yeah, can, right, I'm pretty good at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting about that um, that role of like playing the mother when we feel like we haven't mm. had that. Like we're like out there doing that for everyone else. Um, for me, even like three years ago, I realized that I was doing that in friendship. And um, mm. I was creating like I had a couple of relationships with friends where it was a lot of me showing up for them, which is fine. Um, but then there was no, sh that wasn't reciprocated. And um, I had set boundaries with both of them. Like when I realized that I was, you know, working on my own stuff and one of them was fine with it and we course corrected. And the other one just did not like that. And we're not friends anymore, which is really sad because we were friends for like 20 years. Um, mm. But it's interesting how we end up being that person that we wanted and then what that, what dynamics that creates. So, yeah, yeah because, because often it's not, it's not rooted and it's not centered. And it's not coming from a place of, um, I'm, you know, I'm rooted in my values and, and yeah. what I want. usually like we said, it's coming from a place of, I kind of feel like I need to be this way. And often in my experience, there's a lot of expectations and unreasonable expectations. How often have you, treated somebody how you wanted to be treated and then they don't reciprocate and mm -hmm. the emotion and the rage and the frustration that that can bring yeah yeah I think also at times like it it's probably easier to show up for other people because it feels scary mm -hmm. to have someone show up for you oh just, you're so used big. to it yeah you're so used yeah. to not getting that, that it's like, okay, I'll just, I'll show up for them so much that, that they for like, and keep asking them questions about themselves that they forget to ask me how I'm feeling. Yeah. So there's no room. There's no room. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's no room for me. And, and that feels safe. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, that's absolutely huge. And I, I see that a lot in relationships. And this was this was me and my husband to a T. To yeah. a T, you know. Uh, yeah, I think that's together. what I'm currently going through in my relationship too. <laughs> mm, a little bit. <laughs> it like like definitely when we when we met, I was I was your very typical anxious avoidant. He was very avoidant. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had to numerous times deconstruct the mm -hmm. foundations of well there was barely a foundation there to be quite honest but we've had to deconstruct and rebuild in a way that is aligned and there has been a couple of points over the past 12 years where we've not been sure that we're going to walk through the door together mm -hmm. um really learning yeah. how to love each other and meet each other in a completely different way um I mean, it's been incredible, but so much hard work and accountability and um, just real compassion and patience, you know, back to what you said before, you know, 
it's so common that and I see this a lot and again this was our experience that one of you will kind of be on this journey and it's very very rare that you will both be exactly at the same point on your journeys at the same time Mm -hmm. yeah super rare and it's so even with friendships it's, it's just yeah yeah but it's so important not to make that mean anything that it isn't and I know I used yes. to do that yes yeah I used to do that too I used to judge my partners and be mm. like oh they're not doing the work <laughs> mm. Mm. yeah that'll get you mm-hmm. so what do you think was the the like defining factor for you and your husband to be able to walk through the door together on in those moments where you weren't so sure that that would happen everything like we we had a fight the other morning it's a small fight but you know conflict it happens and um I remember just like leaving the house as you do like I need space I don't (laughs) want to talk right now and I was sitting there and I was really kind of thinking about this And I think this is to your point of defining moment. I really chose to, I always choose love. And I know that sounds, almost sounds a bit cringy as I'm saying it, but (laughs) I, it was very easy for me to, and you see this a lot with the mother wound. This is one of the ways that it manifests is we like to other, other people. Yes. Um, especially when we are so afraid of being abandoned and usually there is a sense of deep loneliness with the mother wound so let's assume that we feel like you feel lonely it's very easy from that place to other somebody else Mm -hmm. and when you don't feel deserving of love and deserving of everything that you are receiving from a person without realizing it we're wanting to push it away and we're wanting to other the other person now, I've done this so much over the past decade with my husband and when I really began to shift into making decisions and living from a place of love like I will always choose love and truth is the greatest expression of that um and that has helped us so 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 much um my kind of go-to was and I I think a lot of women will relate to this listening my kind of go-to was we'll go find someone else then well leave Uh, you know the door you know where the door is like go because it's easier when I stop it's easier to just be like all right this isn't working I'm gonna walk away and Mm -hmm. um even when we like when we learn you know and do the work not to those thoughts will still come up. We might not act on them. They'll no. still come up and you'll no. notice them. You're like, oh, yeah. how interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It happened to me the other day. Yeah. You know? It happened to me the other day. Like my mind immediately went to, what am I going to do? We live in South Africa. Like we, we're we like nomadic. What am I going to do if we're not together? What am I going to do about the kids? And it's just, mm-hmm. and I say this so often, I'm so glad that you brought this up because it's not about that never happening. It's about how you relate to those parts of yourself when she's showing up because she's afraid. Yeah, exactly. It's about you mothering yeah. that part of yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, it's really being able to observe that because I never even to be honest, was able to recognize when that was happening. So it's bringing awareness to that and then bringing a really loving curiosity and warmth and compassion and, you know, Mm -hmm. a mother Mm -hmm. um, to just bear witness to those parts. Um, And that in itself helps dissolve the shame around the story that it's creating, which is you're not good enough and you better, you better figure out your escape plan. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're able to see like because you're because you're accepting that part of yourself i feel like it allows you to be able to see the truth that like mm-hmm. this person in front of you loves you they're a safe person hopefully i mean everyone's situation is different um 
But when you when you reject these parts of yourself, I feel like it alters your perception of like what's actually true because you're so focused on mm -hmm. avoiding your own pain that you that you uh, experienced in the past. You're so focused on like avoiding that happening again that it like distorts <laughs> your like perception of your current reality. It's very fascinating. I find that to be like one of the most fascinating mm -hmm. things about being human. <laughs> Yeah, it's so it's, crazy. it's mind like I, I I'm I'm just like I'm just fascinated and you know curious and and choosing to remain curious has changed my life. Like I yeah. I take nothing. I say this. I I'm just trying to think if I had to word this, but like I almost had to remind myself that I couldn't trust myself. And I say mm -hmm. that in in the context of like, like these thoughts would come in and I would have these very convincing stories and narratives. Mm. And I had to almost remind my we can't quite trust that. Yeah. Um, That's interesting. And, and like I said, just bring in, bringing a curiosity. Yeah. And, and just, I just want to just to tie it back into the mother mood, like what you've just said there about our pain, because I think this is huge. Um, and I know that this was very prominent in my relationship with my mom. And I see this like across the board with mothers and daughters and sons, but you will, you will trigger your mum because that's what we are here to do, trigger our parents. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my kids do it to me all the damn time. And the pain that you are feeling is coming from within you. But often what happens is we think the pain is coming from the person that's just done something. We, we, we believe that they are causing us pain when mm. actually that pain is coming from within. And often what happens is mm. we don't recognize that and we're projecting that back. Like, well, you've done this and you've made me feel this way. Yeah. That is a huge one because when we, when we realize it's coming from ourself, true. yeah, it's not necessarily true. When we realize the pain is coming from ourself, at least in my experience, it, it's helped me have so much more compassion for my mom. And, mm. um, I remember you had a, like a women's circle for mother's day in the UK recently. And, um, mm -hmm. Like it's reminding me of the share I had in there where I was talking about, or maybe I think it was actually when we connected it with, with this podcast, I was telling you that like, I realized I was so busy being like angry at my mom that I forgot that I love her like so much. And mm -hmm. like my own anger and being like, you did this to me, like distracted me from that love. And mm -hmm. um, just because we love someone by the way, doesn't mean that how they treat us is like, okay, like we can still put up boundaries. We can still keep our distance. Like currently I'm not speaking to my mom at the moment. Um, I don't like, I don't call her and I don't like ignore her calls, but she doesn't call me because I trigger her. <laughs> <laughs> And there's the big difference between triggers and abuse. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right? Yeah. Mm hmm And it's also, um, I think, being in a relationship with a safe person that, like, you can feel very seen and loved by, I think, is such a underrated kind of like pillar of support with the mother wound because you have like a witness. Um, mm -hmm. Like, for example, I'm thinking of a very specific instance of one of the times that my mom visited and um, I was already engaged to my husband. We weren't married yet, but it was the first time me, it was just me and my husband and my mom like alone. And he witnessed like how she would talk to me and like how I would shut down and, and, as soon as we were alone in the room, like she like left to go do something. He's like, I don't like how, how she treats you. And I was like, thank you so much for saying that. Cause I feel like shit right now. I'm like, it feels good to like have someone validate that. 
which is why I love your, mm -hmm. your Instagram as well. Like when the more people talk about it and just normalize it and it's like, I understand how you feel. I think with the mother wound, it's like specifically important because mothers are put on a pedestal in our society. It's like you can't say anything bad about her because she's the reason you you even exist on this planet. Yeah, which is just the stupidest thing. Yeah, <laughs> it's just the stupidest thing. But it, it's it's the reality, and it's one of it was one of my biggest barriers to healing for the longest time. You know, you feel yeah. like the biggest bitch that even having these feelings because everything yeah, is telling you like such that a horrible you, person <laughs> yeah and it's it takes time to to really kind of break through that but you are 100% right finding somebody because the mother wound is a relational wound and this is a really important important thing to know is a relational wound and often what happens is we're trying to heal a relational wound in isolation and it just simply does not mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. you know you, healing it in a relationship with somebody else that can witness you and can hold space for you and can say you know what that wasn't okay and how you feel is valid is absolutely fundamental for healing yeah. the mother wound yeah I have like tears of happiness in my eyes right now. <laughs> As <we> say that. <laughs> I love that. So for people who are listening, who maybe want to do a practice or maybe answer a certain journal question or take some little step right now as they're listening towards healing the mother wound, what would you offer them? Oh, good question. Um, I think one of the most important places to start is really, I believe you've really got to start with recognizing what you didn't have, with recognizing what you needed and you didn't receive mm -hmm. is kind of the first step to really kind of understanding what the gap is. Because there is a gap. And we're trying to fill that gap with patterns and behaviors to try and get that love and acceptance and belonging that we didn't necessarily have. So mm -hmm. recognizing what your gap is, I believe, is one of the first steps to um, to recognizing it. So a really simple kind of question would be, what did I need that I didn't receive? Mm. So for me, it was really just a witness um there was never any there was never a how are you how are you feeling like tell me more about that like there was never any sort of validation for especially my emotions uh the, the more kind of negatively perceived emotions um mm -hmm. so one thing that I've really struggled with and I know this is true for most women is anger uh mm -hmm. I was just you know, any sort of kind of anger, I was just labeled an angry person. I need to go calm down. Yeah. Um, so I had a really big gap there. And a lot of women with the mother wound, whenever I say the word, word nourishment, I mean, go, oh my gosh, why, why does that, why do I feel so drawn to that word? And mm -hmm. there's usually a real lack of nourishment. Mm. Yeah. I like to use the, I like to use the metaphor a lot, like, we're great at planting seeds. We're great at watering seeds. We're great at nourishing other people. But when that plant grows and the fruit blooms and you've got that gorgeous like strawberry, the first thing a woman will do is she'll pick it and she'll give it to somebody else. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So I'd for anybody listening if you do resonate with that, what what does nourishment really feel like for you? Like, what would that look like for you? Um, usually we kind of lean into what sounds nice or what other people are doing and never really actually what we need. Yeah. Or what we think but we know should what be doing. <laughs> Absolutely. But to know what you need, you need to you need to be really honest about what you never received. Yeah. Yeah. 
And it's so hard to get there because like part of the mother wound is like taking on this narrative of like being the quote unquote good girl <laughs> because mm -hmm. we're, we're just kind of like trained to act a certain way to be accepted by our mom. Um, yeah. And at least for me, like I can, I very much resonate with what you shared about like lacking a witness and uh, emotional needs not being met. And for me, that was so hard to admit because I had other, like all my physical needs were met. We lived in a nice neighborhood, went to good schools, always had food, always had clothes, went on vacations. And, you know, especially as an adult, I realized like how expensive all that is. And it's like, you feel like such an ungrateful bitch for being like, but no one cared about my feelings. <laughs> when really like we are emotional beings though. And um, it's been, it's been said in like a lot of trauma books that like emotional wounds is, is actually a lot harder to heal from than like physical wounds. Like if you're like physically beaten every day versus like physically just screamed at and berated every day. It's a lot harder mm -hmm. to heal from the emotional one because we internalize it. We internalize yeah. those, those phrases that are being said out loud to us. We internalize like, for example, when no one's showing up to mirror us, we internalize like, Oh, I'm not like, I'm not worthy of quality time or like, I don't matter. That, that was a big one for me. Um, I could just keep talking. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a just, big topic. <laughs> it's just such a, it's huge and it's fascinating and it's so needed. Um, so, so needed. Uh, I was just going to go somewhere then and my thought just poof, it just went out of my head. It'll come back. Yeah, it'll come back. <laughs> it went, it's gone. It went, it's it's gone. gone. Bye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there are a couple questions that I uh, ask every guest and um, feel free to answer the question. And if a thought comes like related to what you say, or if the thought that floated away just came back, like feel free to weave that in. Okay. So the okay. first question is, uh, what does self-love mean to you? Oh, um, my first kind of thought is doing doing the really hard thing mm. honestly um self-love to me is radical honesty mm. radical honesty with yourself I know that when I have done that is when I have felt the most proud of myself the most connected to myself um and usually you know, it's doing the thing, especially, you know, back to what we were saying earlier, you know, when you've lived a life and usually you're living someone else's life, not necessarily your own life. Yeah. Self-love for me has really been the boundaries. It's been saying no when I want to say yes. Yeah. Um, It's been doing the thing that I'm like, I really don't want to do this. I really don't want to do this. But I also know that this is going to be good for me. Mm -hmm. um you know and the 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 alone time the bubble baths you know all of those things are incredible too and so needed but honestly self-love has been the uncomfortable stuff yeah the stuff that has stretched me the stuff that has really kind of moved me into more alignment with what I actually value and, and for me it's truth like truth is definitely at the top of what I value the most um and that's really what love self-love is for me yeah I love that that's not an answer we've heard on the podcast everyone has a different oh really yeah everyone has a oh, different definition cool. yeah I love that what's cool too is um when you think about like doing the hard thing or doing the thing you don't want to in terms of like mothering, um, I immediately think of like a two-year-old who doesn't want to brush their teeth or doesn't want to go to bed at a certain time, but it's like the, the, the mother is there to be like, 
I know you don't have to do it, but you like, you need to for your own health. Like, so you don't get cavities. It's like, it's like that same thing that, that self-love is like showing up for ourself. And like, I know you don't want to do this, but it's, it's for your benefit. And um, yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought of when you shared that. <laughs> yeah. I, th but that's exactly kind of what it's, you know, it's like, I don't want to go to the gym today. I don't want to work out. And it's like, you, it, like, I, I know that I feel my best self and I feel really good about myself when I'm doing the things that I know I need to do mm -hmm. to really be connected to myself. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't always want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And it also feels really good when, uh, when those parts do come up of like, I don't want to go to the gym to take a minute to be like, I hear you. I hear that you don't want to go to the gym. Like, what do you need? Do you want to cry for five minutes before we go to the gym? And then we'll go like, what do you, what do you need from me for like, I have this much yeah. time before we need to leave. Like, what do you need? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Rather than and just berating it's... through. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. And it's just, it's, it's so loving. Um, Mm -hmm. it's so loving something that I used to do and you know really healing my mother wound has been very directly correlated to healing my relationship with authority because one thing I used to do because I grew up with you know I grew up with a couple of parents that you know they were they were, they were doing their best with what they had but it was very authoritarian and it's like you're doing this and there was little room Mm -hmm. um so what happened with me is the way that I relate to myself is there was lots of free passes mm. um I would give myself a million free passes my relationship to authority just kind of wasn't there because to be honest I thought authority meant a bully being a bully and I didn't want to yeah. be a bully so I just went the opposite way and I see this a lot so that makes sense for me it really has been about cultivating yeah cultivating this inner mother that's loving but firm yeah yeah nice balance there I can def definitely relate mm. to that so the next question is what makes you feel the most grounded oh I like these <laughs> cacao <laughs> <clears throat> I put some cacao in my coffee. Being today. barefoot. Ooh, oh, yes. I love cacao. Be wherever I wherever I can. Um, but stillness, stillness and silence. Mm -hmm. Honestly. Um my life has been chaotic, it's been loud. There has not been a lot of space and room for me to really hear and listen. Mm. And I've not created that. For me, I I factor in a lot of stillness and silence into my life. And that really, really helps me feel grounded. Um, mm -hmm. And just doing things that I love, being around people that I love, that energize me, that make me feel good about myself. Um yeah, just very, I feel like it's a boring answer, but just very simple things like simplicity um, yeah. and not a lot of noise and a necessary shit. Mm -hmm. And for the other moms and mushrooms. in the room. <laughs> and mushrooms. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Bring some mushrooms in there. Always helps. <laughs> <It's> always... <clears throat> for the other moms in the room. <laughs> Um, how do you factor mm -hmm. in that time of stillness and alone time? Because I know that's something very difficult to do as a mom. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, this is, a, you know, this has really been a work in progress. It's so much easier for me to take up that space now and ask for what I need and then take it. Mm -hmm. um, so it really boundaries so just little things like, um, so logistical things, like I don't do the morning school run. Nice. My husband gets up and takes takes the kids to school in the morning. Nice. I pick them up. 
Okay. So I will have time in the morning and I will literally just sit there. I will be silent. Uh, often, you know, I stay in my room, they go to school and I don't speak. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have a lot of stillness in the morning. Um, I go away. <laughs> I spend time away from my family and I go and have alone time. So mm-hmm. me and my husband, about probably on average, both of the both of us will take three kind of separate occasions every year where we'll have two to three days alone and we'll go somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, you know, we travel, we're a full time traveling family and wherever we are in the world, I take that. I take yes. that time. That's been that. really crucial for me. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I'm sure working on your own mother wound helps you do that because you get to a place of like, I'm worthy and deserving of taking this time for myself. It's for a lot of moms. Um, I mean, I'm speaking as someone who just has a bunch of friends who have kids. I don't have kids yet. For a lot of moms, they feel like guilty taking that space for themselves because they're not with their kids or they're not with their yeah. family. Uh, when from my perspective, again, as someone who does not have kids, um, I think it's actually something you um, kind of like indirectly are doing for your kids and for your family because you're showing up more whole. You know, you're not like Absolutely. running on empty. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm going to say something here, and this will likely be quite triggering, but I used to do that. And my mum used to do that. And my mm. grandma used to do that. Mm. And I had to get really honest with myself about how I was being a martyr. Mm, yes um because that's something we like to do as mothers you know whether we like to admit that to ourselves or not the truth is usually there is an element of martyrdom Mm. there is an element of resentment there and when you really begin to kind of realize the cost of that you have no choice but to do it there's no such thing as suffering in silence. It doesn't fucking exist. And that really annoys me when I hear that. But that was something that I used to believe. I used to yeah. believe that I was doing a really good job of holding it in and no one could really, you know, I, I've got this. And it's that kind of martyry. As I'm telling you now, I mean, I'm going to go off on a tangent here, but I'll try not to. But women, especially mothers, it's a lot easier to bond over this is really shit. It's really hard. My husband didn't do this. My kids are driving me mad. I need time away. I'm exhausted over. Actually, I don't do that. And, you know, I do take up my space. and I actually don't feel guilty. Most mothers don't feel as guilty as they think that they feel. They just kind of like how that sounds. Mm. Mm. That's good to know. (laughs) I'm grateful to know that before I have kids and make mom friends. <laughs> <laughs> you just, you just have to create new evidence. Yeah. You have to create new evidence. You know, now I have done this and this is part of our, our life as a family, you know, mm-hmm. mommy takes time for herself. My kids know that my kids encourage that because they know and they've experienced me and Mm -hmm. it's just create new evidence that it's safe and you can take up that space and nothing bad is going to happen and this incredible life and family that you have isn't going to fall apart because that's usually the biggest fear it's fear of loss it's like if I do this then I'm going to lose it and what a what a great example you're showing your kids that like as a parent as an adult as a person like you take care of yourself by taking time away and you're worthy of that like your kids are going to like kids emulate what the adults around them are doing so your daughter is going to hopefully also take her own space for herself if she ends up having kids one day in the future yeah it's going to be a damn sight easier for her to do that (laughs) i hope yeah 
yeah, I mean, she did it already. She's example. almost 10. And Aww. yeah, even now she's like, mommy, I'm going to go up to my room and I'm going to take some, and I'm like, I love tell it. me what you need. We I love keep that. The door, you know, and it's just, it's, it's normal. It's normalized. And it's, yeah, I love that. Um, yeah. You know, it's how I take care of them by taking care of me. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's not just liking how that sounds, but actually moving through the discomfort of, I feel like a really shit mum right now. And, you know, mm-hmm. it gets easier. It gets better. Mm-hmm. The last question uh, before we ask about where people can find you is my favorite question. And it's, what is your favorite part about being a woman? <laughs> Wow, what a great question. Okay. The people usually get this stumped at this question. Yeah. That's my favorite part. Yeah, this, this happens. <laughs> people are like, oh, I wasn't expecting you to ask me that. <laughs> I I love the, I love I'm trying not to use like a really cliche answer but like <laughs> words that come into me are like power like I love the the power and the mystery that is the feminine mm-hmm. I love the depth I love the chaos I love the messiness and they are things that I never thought that I would say <laughs> um I love the way that we can empower and inspire like that's something that I'm really stepping into at the moment especially in my relationship and it's yeah wow wow I'm actually stumped (laughs) yeah I don't even know if that was a I don't know that was a full answer. I don't think it was. Yeah. Well, if you want to journal on that question and share with me. And then we write it in the and then (laughs) we write it. Record a little thing. And yeah, yeah. And I can be like, (laughs) by the way, here's an update. (laughs) Yeah, I just yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna really think about that one. But yeah, like mystery. Yeah. And like the multi, the multi dimensional kind of. Mm-hmm. I'm going to think about that. Mm-hmm. I could sense a little bit of a I flavor of what you're sharing. <laughs> yeah. I love being a woman. And that's not something that I ever truly loved. So that's pretty yes, cool. I relate. <laughs> I always thought it yeah. was a burden to be a yeah. girl when I was a kid. Mm. so Mm. I was a tom I was like a tomboy because of that Mm. and now like I I would not have it any other way (laughs) no no same same I I really love it but it's just kind of yeah like I think I was always kind of really afraid of I don't know if you can relate to this but I always knew that I was very powerful in a way that a man is it's it's different it's like a feminine power it's it's I always felt that and I was always very afraid of that and now I'm kind of really tapping into that and learning how to be with it and move with it and it's it's really changing my life in the most incredible ways and that's something that I love about being a woman because we can see things and tap into things and frequencies that you know men just don't get to um, and it's not an either or or good or bad. It's just different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I also do think some men maybe can tap into that. It's just very rare. Mm. I think. I've come across a handful of men who have like very deep intuition. Mm-hmm. And um, because the feminine, like the feminine qualities exist in everyone, no matter like what yeah. you're what your gender is Um, but I think collectively there has been a fear of the power of the feminine collectively and you know that's why Mm. patriarchy exists 
which we can go off on a whole different conversation right, right now about that. <laughs> it's it's the it's the creation element of being a woman I think yeah like our ability to kind of create and that life force I think I think when I think about power it's the life force that I think I've always felt a little bit afraid of mm. yeah because um, that feels huge mm -hmm. um but uh, it's like now I I want a baby but I don't think it's necessarily a baby that I want. It's that feeling I'm getting. It's just something wants to be birthed, like something yeah. wants to come through me and be created. And that's really cool and exciting. And I'm kind of playing around with that. Yeah. Plus awesome. it's fun to dress up and, you know. Yeah, we have so much more variety when it comes to, I mean, anyone can wear anything, but we have so much more variety without judgment, typically, in the Western world to... Mm -hmm wear pants and skirts and dresses and shorts and yeah mm. yeah I think those boundaries are kind of being pushed a little bit um, depending on where you are in the world like in New York City yeah. for example you can walk around and see a man in a skirt it's like a normal everyday occurrence now in 2024 I love that <laughs> yeah I love it too I love that <laughs> <clears throat> um so for everyone listening who's tuned in, where can they find you online? And if there's any like freebie or anything that you will be sharing for the show notes, feel free to share about that as well. Oh, okay, cool. So yeah, the, the best place to find me is usually Instagram or TikTok. And I have the same handle for both. Um, I am Michaela Tyson. I'm sure you'll pop it in the show notes. Yes. Um, but I'm, I'm actually in the process of putting something together, predominantly for uh, mothers who have daughters. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and yeah, that's where you can find me right now. Is there a name for what you're putting together or is it still in the, is this what you're birthing? <laughs> I've not figured it out yet. I've okay. not figured it out yet, but it's coming. Um, okay. So this might be the baby you were talking have... about. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I'm actually, I'm, I have a, I'm, I've been asked to do this for years and years, but I'm mm. as of doing my own podcast, which I'm very excited about. Ooh. So hopefully that is coming in may towards the end of may so keep your eyes is rather peeled for that i'm excited right. very nice thank you so much for chatting with me today i wish we had like more hours oh, and hours you. of time <laughs> i know it goes so fast it does it really does 